Thanks everybody for uh, waiting patiently. Uh, my name is Guy Pujarni, and I'm here today to talk to you about serverless security. I guess you're talking about serverless all day uh, in general in this conference, but specifically to talk about security. Uh, a little bit of context about me. Uh, my history, like today I am the CEO and co-founder of Sneak, where we deal with open source security and specifically touch serverless security. Uh, before that, it was part of the kind of Israeli Defense Forces uh, cyber parts of the, sort of the IDF army, the Israeli army, and then uh, worked in the application security space for many years before spending about six years in the world of performance, uh, including being CTO at Akamai. So my, my background comes from this mix of security and maybe some perf and ops uh, aspects of it, just for, for what it's worth. So let's dig into it. Serverless changes security. My kind of key point, you know, as I will elaborate for the next 40, 45 minutes, uh, is, is really the serverless changes security, right? It makes some security aspects better, some neutral, and some worse. This is the cop-out slide. <laughs> you know, it really doesn't say anything about it. Uh, and I guess we could conclude over here, but maybe, <laughs> maybe we'll elaborate a little bit more about which ones of them. So what we're going to do is we're going to dig into each one of these three aspects, into what aspects uh, get better. We'll start with a positive, and we'll uh, you know, be optimistic, and then we'll expand into things that are neutral but a little bit different, and then into areas that I believe serverless makes worse for security. Sounds good? So when is serverless better for security? First, and as the name implies, serverless has no servers. <laughs> uh, I, I think every single talk here is going to tell you how that is a fallacy, and there are servers behind the scenes, and you probably all know this. But what is important is that there are no servers that you manage, right? Server management less. That was just not as catchy. Um, so, so the servers that you use to need to patch and organize uh, are no longer, that's no longer your responsibility. And that gets me to the first area, first aspect of serverless security that gets better, which is you don't need to worry about vulnerable or you need to worry less about vulnerable operating system dependencies. In general, I will say less <coughs> versus no need to worry about it because it is still your responsibility when you deploy an app, even if some aspect of it has become the platform's operations, it's still, if it's your application and you get hacked, the customer doesn't care that you, know, you use this cloud provider and they were supposed to do it. So you need to worry about it less. So the first area is that you need to worry less about vulnerable operating uh, system dependencies. Uh, we hear about those all the time, right? There was Heartbleed, probably the biggest like, mainstream media known vulnerability, right, that, that makes it that you know, your mother might know about this open SSL vulnerability you know, that, uh, that hit the world. But there were others. There was Shellshock shortly after. More recently, we had Meltdown and Spectre, all these brand name designer vulnerabilities that are just very, very prevalent. The thing about these vulnerabilities is not that they're more severe than vulnerabilities that you would write yourself, but rather they are more prevalent. They're, they spread around the world. And attackers know this, and that makes them very, very compelling for attackers. Um, in fact, if you look at a bunch of these assessments, there's a million statements that, that back, the fact, uh, back this fact. Uh, pretty much everybody agrees that the majority of exploits in the wild, the, definitely the majority of attacks and the majority of successful exploits, come because of these unpatched systems, unpatched servers. Verizon says that most attacks exploit these types of known vulnerabilities that haven't been patched despite being, patches being available for months or even years. It's hard to wrangle these servers. Semantic goes as far as saying that by the end of next year, or by the end of 2020, 99% of vulnerabilities exploit will have been known for at least one year. Right? That's a large percentage. Uh, and it's because wrangling these servers, you know, managing 10,000 servers and keeping them up to date and patching them as your business rolls is not an easy fit. And with serverless, you don't need to do it. You know, it's not your problem. It is your responsibility, your kind of ownership, but the operation of it comes down to the platform. And the pros who do this for a living, right, whose business it is to operate servers, to wrangle many, many, many servers, uh, they do this. They run it. Uh, and because it's their core competency, they do it well. So they do it presumably better than most of us, right, that, that, that don't do this for a living, uh, and it's not our profession. So the first point is you don't need to worry about this. In this aspect, FAS, or function as a service, is really not unique. It didn't invent this concept. Platform as a service, platforms like Heroku and Cloud Foundry have been doing this for a while. Uh, so it's about the same, but serverless does a lot of other things better than platform as a service, so it brings that type of opportunity uh, up to the forefront. But you know, this, the same bullet showed up in a Heroku slide, for instance, or could have shown up in a Heroku security slide uh, many years ago. Sounds good? This is a short 
statement because I'm going to focus on the areas that are not as good that you need to still do things about. Uh, but it is a very, very significant one, right? Just in one fell sweep, if you deploy on serverless, you don't need to worry about patching your servers, which is the primary ways attackers come in. Good. Second thing you need to worry less about is denial of service. Who here knows what denial of service is? OK, just checking if you're awake. Uh, <laughs> so denial of service is a high level. You know, the way it manifests is that it tries to, to send requests that are heavy in some capacity, that you send a small request, and it drives a lot of traffic. You can, you can just you know, brute force your way to a denial of service and just send a lot of requests. But the, the best denial of service attacks are ones that try to identify a case where a small request can create you know, a large a large response, a large load, a large amount of activity on the server. And because of that, it takes down the server. And when the server is down, it cannot serve other customers. So this bad traffic takes down the server, prevents good traffic from being processed. Um, and there's a bunch of different denial of service attacks. That doesn't really matter. In FAS, in function as a service, so serverless world, there, there are no long-standing servers. There's no servers to take down to prevent them from doing it. The platform just auto scales, you know, it's magic. <laughs> it just comes in, a request comes along, and another server gets pulled up. And that is great for your slash dot moment, or hacker news, I guess I'm kind of dating myself a little bit with a slash dot reference here. Uh, you know, it's good, it, it, it is relevant when you have good traffic that you can now cope with it, but it's also relevant for bad traffic. So denial of service is another aspect where overall, serverless just makes it go away. But there are a few caveats that you have to keep in mind here. Yeah. There are a few caveats. Hold that thought. Good, fair point. So a few caveats, not just that one. Um, one, uh, there is a limit. So the platforms don't allow you to just you know, run a million functions concurrently without any conversation with them. Uh, AWS, which is the one most, li more, most often used, has a, a limit of 1,000 concurrent functions. They keep bumping that up. It used to be 300, it was 600, then it was 1,000. Uh, so you can get 1,000 concurrent functions. Still, that's quite significant to prevent a DOS attack. Second caveat is resource exhaustion. The number of, like, if, if you go through pretty much any story of how we moved to serverless, you will find some database server, some third-party system, some other that crumbled under the load uh, once the you know, magnificently, magnificently elastic serverless environment ran into a slightly more old-world uh, back-end system or component. So you have to be careful about that. Uh, the third caveat is a little bit more if you're a true target. Uh, who here knows what a DDoS is? Okay, some good. So DDoS, you know, in general is, is a distributed denial of service, and it implies that really the way you're taken down is just these very large volumes of traffic that literally choke the pipe that gets to your server. So it's not about your serverless framework or the other. It's about just a huge volume of attack that just takes down uh, prevents access, prevents somebody from asking you a question because they can never get through the line, the network line. So there's a bunch of different variations of DDoS, but there is a size in which it doesn't help you that you're serverless. If they clogged the pipe, it doesn't matter what your backend system or how your system operates on it. So for those, if you suspect those, if you worry about them, high level, if you use public cloud, then you're in reasonably decent shape depending on how you configure that, but you can use dedicated DDoS protection environments for that, those solutions for it. And then the last caveat that was pointed over here is um, DDoS can d still do what, what I like to refer to as a, as a billing DOS, which is it denies access to your bank account. <laughs> uh, you basically pay enough through this element that it just it blocks. Uh, you still pay for that execution time, uh, and it can get very, very pricey. Um, so all in all, serverless kind of makes DOS go away, but it has some concerns uh, that you have to be, some caveats that you have to be aware of. Good. And then the third bullet that you need to worry about less is a little bit more obscure, and that is long-lived compromised servers. So you know, we all watch these, these films that show how an attacker comes in and hacks into the Pentagon with four terminals, and uh, you know, they have some iTerm2 uh, set up, and they're clicking some things, and, uh, and they, they, they go through and they break into the system, right, success. Doesn't really work that way, no? It doesn't work that way as you know in terms of like, you know, the many monitors and the likes, but also it doesn't tend to happen at once. What attackers tend to do, the real world attacks, is they happen in stages. Attackers try to come in to a system, break in, install some agent, and then lay in wait. You know, lie in wait, lay in wait. Just wait for, uh, for an opportunity. First of all, see that nobody caught you, 
and it'll just sort of sit there quietly and see that you're around, and then start sniffing around and start going deeper. Can I find some data sources and download them? Can I, can I find another aspect of the system that I can penetrate through? So in function as a service or in serverless, and I guess I should say this up front, is I'm using FAS and serverless very interchangeably here a little bit. To be honest, I don't have a ton to say about the security aspects of the event element of, uh, of serverless. So I'm thinking about serverless and FAS from a security perspective as you know, it's, FAS is the more important, uh, the function as a service bit is more important from a security implications perspective. So just to get this out of the way, I'm using those two terms kind of interchangeably here. So, so FAS, what it does is it forces statelessness. You cannot, you have to design your system such that it assumes that every new function that gets invoked gets invoked on a brand new system. So you can't rely on some in-memory uh, information or, or other state information in your system. And those systems generally get wiped out. We'll talk about, about that in a sec, but generally they get wiped out often. So this notion of a long-standing server is not something that exists anymore. So that means attackers need to repeatedly compromise you. Every time they compromise, they carry the risk of getting detected, and they carry the risk of you uh, plugging the hole, right? no longer allowing them to do it. They have to actually do that, that movie style, get through all the way in one stroke. Um, one caveat that is important here to say is that while serverless forces statelessness, it doesn't mean that those systems will run you know, one server per function. In fact, they won't. They will not do that. Cloud providers keep containers warm or keep the server environments warm. So they would launch a machine, they would run your function, and then they would keep that server running for the next person or next user who wants to, uh, who wants to invoke that function. And when will they take it down? It's really up to them. You know, if they have excess capacity, they might just keep it running for, for hours. You know, I've seen it sometimes as days. I don't know if I've seen days. I've seen many, many hours. Um, so they can run for a very long time, or it could indeed be that they will shut it down after that one request. It's really, it's, it's none of your business, you know, from their perspective, right? It's, uh, it's, it's their system, but you cannot rely on these containers being, you know, truly stateless, truly single-use containers, but because you cannot rely on them also being stateful, uh, then you have to design your applications in a way that forces, that, that, that doesn't assume state. Sound good? And in this aspect, I'd say function as a service is better than PaaS. So both on the denial of service element and around the long-standing servers, when you think about a Heroku, you think about a Cloud Foundry, you think about these platforms as a service, yes, they manage the servers for you, but they don't manage the elasticity quite as well. They still have servers that run for a longer period of time. So they're not, they're not quite there. Google App Engine, by the way, is much more serverless than it is PaaS, so maybe that's the one that's a caveat. So in those two last security aspects, serverless is actually better than PaaS. Sounds good? Cool. So this is the positive. It's the last time I'm going to be positive <laughs> in, this, uh, in this conversation, right? Three areas that serverless is better as far as security. It handles operating system dependencies. Uh, it takes away denial of service. And it takes away this concern of long-lived uh, compromised servers because there's no long-lived servers to begin with. So attackers are just going to give up, right? <laughs> Nothing to do here, you know? Go away. Go attack somebody else's system. Right? Not so much, right? Attackers will shift over and they will pay attention into the areas of security, the aspects of security that still remain open and try to tackle those. So let's dig into those. When is serverless neutral for security? Neutral as in it's neither better nor worse, but it is different enough that I found it worthy to sort of mention it here in this talk. Good? So the first one I'm going to talk about is maybe the, is probably the most important in this category, and that is permissions. So permissions is a, is a broad thing. It includes a bunch of things. It includes the question about who can invoke your function, so permissions coming in, kind of the ingress, the inbound, who can call this piece of functionality. Um, they can include the resources around it, who can access the code, the environment variables, the secrets that might be embedded in your application. It also includes what your function does, or from a security perspective, if your function was compromised, what can it do? What are the permissions of this function to do outside? It's kind of the inbound, the outbound, and then the assets that are in between. And permissions are one of those things that really comes down to ease. And this is, I guess before I even show the slide, comes down a little bit to pet peeve. The world of serverless is amazing, and it makes so many things so damn easy. And that's great, but then it also kind of instills laziness in us. And a bunch of these things that I'm going to talk about are patterns that I see when people use serverless, but 
they're really, they're not because something cannot be done in serverless, but because it's just a tiny bit harder, or not as easy. I don't even want to use the word hard. Just not quite as easy uh, as it is uh, other, to do other aspects of serverless. So with that, you know, when you look at a typical serverless setup, typically there is a bunch of functions. You think of them still as an application that's made up of a bunch of functions. You have a policy, you deploy it. This might look like this from a serverless YAML perspective. Might be a bunch of functions in this one serverless YAML file, you know, different to-do functions over here. And then somewhere at the top, you have this, which is the permissions. And it says, for this YAML file, here are the functions that are deployed. And when you do this, when you deploy a function like this, which is, you know, then you are like everybody else, <laughs> like most people uh, do precisely that. They have one YAML file, they consider an app, they consider a group of functions, still as this unit. We haven't really morphed our thinking and our development processes for the most part to be very truly function oriented. They're still the app. And then when we deploy it, it means all the code, you know, all the code in all of these functions get deployed as one unit. All of the, uh, you don't actually see my mouse here, uh, <laughs> all of the permissions that are listed at the top, every one of these functions gets all of those permissions. And that seems obvious when I mention that, you know, that is not good, but it's the natural way that things develop. If you find open source projects, open source examples for serverless, which is kind of the way we develop, right? We find an <laughs> example and we, we key off that, then you would be deploying in this far overly exposed environments. So, I'd like you to remember that while this is easier, this is safer. It's to think about every one of these policies as, as its own entity. You know, take this function and minimize, give it the policy that is the minimum it needs to be able to operate. Furthermore, I'd encourage you to, to keep these policies granular. And here we're starting to getting into a little bit trouble land. You know, this is not just about easy. Keeping the policy granular means for every function, tracking the precise permissions that it needs and resisting temptation to give overly broad permissions. Right? Also resisting temptation to say, oh, I'm going to like, add this data resource, this database to the, to the uh, environment, so I will just give all of my functions access to that database. But rather be granular, be small. I'll talk about that more in a sec. This, this requires to be able to do this to hundreds of functions, to thousands of functions, it requires some thinking about how functions are deployed in your environment. How do you, how do you roll out functions? It goes beyond that serverless framework. Say, how do you manage this? How do you monitor these types of policies over time? Um, there's actually a good talk. It's a bit, it's old but good. Still shows the sort of the concept of it from iRobot, from Aaron there. Uh, it talks about how they've built a system. They've since evolved it, but I think this is just the best talk that I have describing how they've built an IAM-based uh, like automated generation of the IAM roles to just ensure that they remain minimal, that they remain you know, just the minimum policy that every function requires. So keep them minimal. Use this list privilege principle. You know, give them the minimum permissions. This is kind of my view on, on policies you know, and permissions. You know, the way they do it, they, the, the, the life cycle of a policy or a permission set is that it expands and expands until somebody adds an asterisk. That's just the way it works. Uh, and it's really hard, it's scary as hell to remove a bit of permission, right? You know, you have, there's a working system and you would go in and remove a bit of permission from that system, I dare you. You know, that is really, really scary stuff, right? And even if it's something you wrote yourself six months ago, let alone something that a teammate has wrote, you know, I'm not even talking about one in which that team member is also no longer with the company, right? So it's a very, very, uh, critical element, I guess a slightly less sassy way of saying it is saying adding permissions is easy, but removing permissions is really, really hard. So you have to think about those. You have to keep those permissions granular, keep them small. It's something you can do today, and it's going to be oh so hard to fix if you don't do it today to fix this tomorrow. Uh, one small caveat and maybe a bit of a, an interesting tool evolution on it. Uh, the permissions, when we talk about permissions right now, these permissions within these functions are, are still at the resolution of, of the platform actions. It's around resource action to the database. It's around you know, invocation of another Lambda function and things of that nature. Uh, there is actually a nice uh, open source, or I don't know if it's open source, but a free solution from PureSec. They're actually down, uh, down at the sponsor area uh, called Function Shield that just further constrains these functions to not allow them to, uh, to perform IO actions or write to the slash GMP folder, types of activities that many functions do not require, that most functions do not require, uh, but that some do. So 
if you can whitelist and only allow this to the ones that, that are relevant, then you know, you're better off again. The more you constrain your application, the better. So all in all, this is one of those areas where, where I, I, I wasn't sure if to put them in the better or in the neutral. Uh, and because I think fundamentally serverless is a bit better, you know, the platform, the fact that you're working in these functions, small units that you can granularly define, makes it better for security. But practically, nobody does it. <laughs> no, or like, not nobody, but few, few people do it. So most people don't take advantage on it. And I will say that the tooling don't make it easy enough yet. So there's evolution on the tool side to just make that type of large-scale management of type permissions better. But when it's managed, managed properly, it is better. So you know, it's a little bit. It's here on the neutral side you know, with, a, with a, a wink towards the, uh, the better. Second, good on this one. Second bit I'm going to talk about that you still need to worry about, that you need to worry about in a non-serverless environment, but also in this one, is securing data at rest. So because you've, want, you've gone serverless, it doesn't make the data go away. Right? FAS apps still store data, and that data can still be stolen. They can still be manipulated, can still be tampered with. So there is data there. It didn't go away. And in fact, when you think about the negative aspect of it, in a function, uh, a function as a service environment, more of that data needs to sit outside the server. So a lot of sensitive elements that, uh, if anybody has done any like compliance work here or security work, when you talk about servers, a very common uh, uh, approach to data is to never let it leave your server. When you talk about, for instance, managing sessions and some secret related to that session, you only keep it in memory in the server that you interact with, and you make sure that the stickiness is there, so like that the same user would keep getting to that same server. And when you work that way, you're out of range for like you know a whole bunch of security concerns and compliance concerns because that data was never persisted to disk. So if it's some private data, if you got some payment card, right, or some PII or anything like that. You can't do that in serverless. It goes away. That data has to be persisted somewhere. It has to be off the machine. Uh, and you probably use some Redis instance or something like that to store those components. So it's a security uh, methodology or trick that you can no longer use. On the flip side, you know, the, that was the bad. And again, this is the kind of the neutral area. Uh, on the good side, when you work in those types of servers, then data access is very broad. It's like my application needs access to these areas. While in serverless, you can actually be far more granular. You can say that this specific function should access this specific table in the database. Right? You can be very, very granular about who is allowed to access what data, which in turn actually protects your data. Right? If somebody does an Equifax-style hack on you, they can't just download the database with all the data for it. It's only what that specific function was allowed to access. So a few tips and tricks into this area. So this is one area that you just need to pay attention to. What can you do to secure that data? All of these are techniques that you can use in a non-serverless environment as well. You want to encrypt all this sensitive, persistent data. So if you have um, data that you persist that is sensitive, you have to encrypt it. I guess I don't really have another way to, to, to persist this. Um, you, have to, you would want to encrypt state data. State data is not always persistent. But you definitely have decreased in this is type of data that would have been stored in, in, in um, memory, like session data. I guess I wrote state here. I think more session data. When you talk about data that's associated to this user, it's always a little bit at risk of being seen as personal. If you store it off disk, encrypt it. Um, minimize the functions that can access each data store. This is that opportunity that I just mentioned right now. Just make sure you take advantage of it. Um, this is something that few people do, uh, and I'd recommend. Use separate databases or da database uh, credentials for every function. So that you know, if one of those functions was compromised or to further control the, kind of the access permissions of that function, uh, you know, just gives you more of that granularity. A, a big part of this is because you know, I mentioned that you can control it such that every function would be able to access this table uh, or the other. That is typically not doable at the kind of AWS permission level resolution, but you can, what you can do is you can give each one of these functions a different database user, and that database user can, you know, can have different permissions. The key, the easiest thing to do here is to separate your read-only users from your write users. Right? That is the easiest. At the minimum, at least use a read-only user and one that can write, because most of your functions, very, very few of your functions should be allowed to write. Um, and then the last bit I would say, and that's a little bit tricky to do still in the world's in, in today's world, I'll, I'll talk about tooling in a sec, uh, is to monitor. Monitor which functions are accessing which data. So just take a look and see how data flows within your system, what data gets accessed, and see if that's right, you know, or identify anomalies in it. 
I'll talk a little bit about tooling here. This is more aspirational, because there's no clear cut, how do you do it? Good, so we talked about securing data at rest, right? We talked about uh, permissions, talked about securing data at rest, and then the two, there's two others that I'll talk about here. The first one I'll just briefly touch on, and that's vulnerabilities in your code. So general statement, serverless doesn't help secure your app. The app layer, everything that's sort of in the actual application that you're running in your code, that's still on you. And what happens here is that that, that aspect, that, that component in your application, which is your own code or kind of your own system, uh, becomes more at the spotlight for attackers because a lot of those other security concerns went away. I'll talk about that more. So, so you have to just make sure that you give it attention. Now, I'm not gonna turn this into an AppSec 101, but this area includes all those goodies, you know, SQL injection, cross-site scripting, remote command execution, a variety of those types of security concerns. If you're not sure where to start, OS Top 10 is a good one. It's a 2013 version that has been somewhat controversially converted into a 2017 uh, version. Just there's always some politics around what makes it to the top 10. But whatever it is, if you're handling all of those top 10, you are way better than most of the industry, you know, in terms of like uh, where you stand. So if you're not sure where to start, that is probably the easiest uh, perspective, you know, to think about the OWASP top 10 and how do you handle those, at least a way to, uh, to, to kind of consider your initial security posture for application security. Cool. A few quick AppSec tips. Again, not going to turn this into a full-blown AppSec uh, element. You can consider dynamic application security testing. It used to be called black box testing tools that probe your application like a hacker from the outside and try to tell you, hey, I've managed to get in. Uh, you can use static application security testing. Those are code analyzers that analyze your code and try to find any potential data flow through your system. Dynamic application security testing, or DAST, has a challenge with coverage. It's only as good as how much of the application it covered. SAST has a problem with false positives. It finds paths that are theoretically maybe potentially possible through your system that are vulnerable, but many of them are, are not practically relevant, so they're deemed false positives. So you have to think about strategizing those. Um, and then when you talk about not just tooling, but your own code, you want to standardize input processing to include sanitization of input. That's a big deal in serverless. It probably implies that you need to use some libraries that do that input sanitization, because there's no longer one entry point that processes that input. So you want to think about standardizing those libraries. Um, you can use the API gateway. So depending on the function and the type of invocations, oftentimes now you have a defined entity that handles your API, the API gateway whenever you're processing this HTTP request. So whenever you can, you can actually use strict schemas there. Once again, don't be tempted to just say, this is just a string variable, and then you convert it into an int. If you said that it's int, you're using a security control, right? You're using the API gateway to say this input must be of this format, right? And then, and this will be its own kind of bullet later on, is secure each function independently. And this is just to plant the seed this is a point in which the fact that these functions are small gives us an opportunity to test them from a security perspective far better than the opportunities that we had before. So the last bit that I have around uh, things that are neutral in the world of serverless is kind of my stomping ground right now with Snake, which is vulnerable application dependencies. So we talked about operating system dependencies, but the serverless functions, while they don't manage those, they still use application dependencies. So you use NPM libraries, you use Maven libraries, you use PyPy. Uh, and those functions, or, or in fact, I'll go as far as saying that for many of these functions, the majority of code is dependencies. And I'll do a little bit of an exercise here. So this is, you don't need to read the code, you know, this is a real example from the serverless functions, uh, uh, serverless framework uh, examples. It has 19 lines of code, it uses two libraries to do it. It fetches a file from uh, HTTP and stores it in S3. So it uses the AWS SDK to store to S3 and node fetch to fetch them, right? That's two direct dependencies. They in turn use other libraries, so there are 19 libraries overall. How many lines of code in total? So 190,000 lines of code. Um, and this really brings up to, to fairly simple math. Like, where is a vulnerability more likely to lie? <laughs> in the 19 lines of code? or in the 190,000 lines of code. It's not to say that that code is lower quality. In fact, oftentimes it's more tested than your own code, but it's a lot of it, it's a lot of it, and it could be vulnerable. So roughly speaking, more code does imply more vulnerabilities, just more bugs, there's more functionality for it to have bugs. And over time, 
these dependencies, they disappear into our systems. They grow stale and they grow vulnerable. They don't really grow vulnerable. They were just as vulnerable the day we deploy them as, uh, as you know, whatever, three years after. But the vulnerabilities in them are discovered. And once they are discovered, you know, a, a vulnerability is disclosed publicly, and then attackers quickly build attack tools to it and they look to exploit them. And Equifax gave us a glorious example of what happens when you do not respond faster than the attackers. Right? When you think about it, at the end of the day, they patched their system four months after a vulnerability was disclosed. You know, there was this vulnerability in the Struts library. They did patch it. They patched it about four months after. Four months for many enterprises is not that slow, <laughs> uh, except two months into that, they got hacked. You know, and again, fairly royally uh, in this case. So in the world of serverless, the platform manages your operating system dependencies, but you have to manage your application dependencies. You have to manage whether they have known vulnerabilities. Allow me a quick shameless plug here, just given I'm talking about my turf. You can use Snake to do this. We can connect your Lambda or Azure functions or other environment, ask you which functions you want to test, quickly tell you whether you're using vulnerable libraries, give you a lot more information about it, but really what we all care about is fix them. Automatically open fix pull requests that make those vulnerabilities go away, and then monitor for those new vulnerabilities that get disclosed that affect your dependencies and, and open those fixed PRs and notify you that there's a, a struts-like vulnerability you should take care of urgently. Okay, and shameless plug. Pretend that never happened. Um, cool, so we talked about four elements that are neutral, and I think I'm already a little bit over time, or like behind my schedule. Permissions, securing data at rest, vulnerabilities in your own code, uh, and vulnerable application dependencies. All areas that you should worry about regardless of whether this is serverless or not, but they're a little bit different in profile. And my last point on this category is just to say that, as I mentioned, neutral kind of means worse because attackers are lazy, just like the rest of us. You know, like we all try to do the most with the least effort, you know, at the end of the day, capitalist model or whatever. Um, you know, that's the way that we work. Uh, and so attackers will look for the easy way in. And if you took away their precious, you know, unpatched servers, they're going to look for those unpatched applications, right? That's going to be kind of their, their next focus area. So last and very much not least in terms of our attention, and getting a little bit more meta for some of those, is when is serverless wars for security? So when did it cause something that, you know, to, to, be, to require greater investment, not just different investments? So I'll start off by saying that serverless conceptually doesn't introduce brand new security vulnerabilities. It introduces some needs about how do you address those vulnerabilities. But really what it does is it just morphs priorities. It makes some concerns less of an issue, others more, and it requires different attention from your perspective. You still need to worry about operating, patching the servers. You just need to worry about it a lot less because really all you need to do is ask AWS if you're doing it, right? Or like understand how they're doing it. So I will talk about, so it doesn't introduce those new vulnerabilities, but it does drive more of certain behaviors. And I'll specifically talk about three behaviors, three attributes of your application that serverless drives doing more of, which are independent, using more independent services, like more separate independent services, using more flexible interfaces, just kind of more functions, more flexibility, and using more third-party services. So we'll talk about those as we, as we evolve. We'll actually go the other way around. So I'll start from those third-party services. So uh, once again, third-party services are something you use in your application no matter what. But in serverless, because, because of the nature of the beast, because every function is very small, it really lends itself to be using more of those third-party components, whether they are uh, uh, or services, sorry, uh, whether they are you know, AWS's or Google's or Azure's large suite of functions that you're using internally, or all these like whatever, email, uh, a remote database element on it, you know, like some, some reporting, some APM component, you're just using more of those third-party services. From a security perspective, you have to worry about those. You know, for each one of those services, you want to ask a bunch of questions. One, what data are you sharing? That's maybe the most obvious one. What data are you sending to them, and how well are they protecting that data, and is that good enough? The second, a little bit less obvious, is, is data in transit secured? Check there's still an alarming number of third-party services that their default examples send information over HTTP and not HTTPS. There's no guarantee that that channel of making that HTTP request will be secure. In fact, typically it would not be. There's definitely other players in, the, in that kind of path that can see that data and manipulate it. So check it. Is it in the same VPC? Is it encrypted? Is it using HTTPS? Third one, very often admitted, is who are you talking to? 
You know, we keep talking about authentication in a one-way element. You make a request to a service, you provide an API token, and you log in. Uh, but how often do you get to validate that the service you're talking to is indeed the service? So this is another case where if you use the HTTPS, oftentimes that's, that's enough. If you're not using HTTPS, you're using some alternate protocol or some alternate um, uh, encryption model for it. Make sure you have a way to validate that they are the entity that you think they are. Fourth of five uh, is do you trust its responses? You know, who here does input sanitization for the responses from third-party services, right? So I think very few people do, you know, not a lot of hands in part because I asked a complicated question, but also uh, because, you know, it's just not commonly done. Like we know we shouldn't trust input from users, but we forget we also shouldn't trust input from third-party services. You know, they might be malicious, they might be compromised, uh, they might just be irresponsible, whatever it is, we should validate that the input we got from the third-party service is also kosher, right? It's also the right way. And then last and, and, and not least is how do we store those API keys? If now we have you know, many, many of these API keys because we're interacting with a lot of these systems, we have to be more methodical around how do we keep them. Fortunately, KMS to the rescue, every one of these serverless platforms has a key management system uh, that is around, make sure you use it, and then when you use it, make sure you capitalize on it by rotating keys often. If you use a KMS to store your key, again, just like a lost opportunity. Most organizations that I see that use a key management system store a key in the KMS and then have the system magically take that KMS and t take the key from the KMS uh, and then you know, just use it. And then that key remains static forever. You know, if, you, if you use a KMS, you can rotate the keys super, super easily. All you need is an API on the other side, on that third-party service, to issue a new key and then update the key in your KMS. Your system is already set up to just dynamically read it from the KMS. So it's such an opportunity for you to improve your security posture. So those are the five bullets. You know, just, I talked about each of them, so I'm not going to repeat it. But you want to make sure that you, um, that, that you survey the security of those third-party services that you use. Um, and I will add that you also want to worry about first-party services. So you want to think about your own other units, your own other functions, as, uh, as, as, as kind of third-party services for your own. Otherwise, you're as strong as your weakest link. Right? It means that if one, I have another talk I gave about serverless security where I break into a serverless application dynamically and kind of hack into it. Sorry if you got the less entertaining one here. Uh, <laughs> this one's more meta and more structured. Um, but you know, as you break through, you break through one function, and then, et voila, you have access to the rest of your system. So you don't want to be as strong as your weakest link. Not all of these functions would be equally secure. Not all of them would be written by developers that are equally security competent or aware. Try to think about them. Try to not trust those other functions to the extent you can. There's not a lot of great tooling here. You know, I try to, to in general, include uh, elements. But uh, there's been a big, big leg up. Like the first time I gave a talk around this notion, X-Ray did not exist, and X-Ray very much provides a lot of those elements. It just allows you, if you're familiar with AWS X-Ray, it allows you to just monitor activity within AWS as a whole, uh, but specifically reaching out into external services as well, or external entities. So it just allows you to see what type of invocations occurred if you instrument your applications correctly. So you can use the relevant HTTP libraries. This is a Node.js example. They support all the other platforms as well. So I recommend that for just giving you insight to be able to ask the question, what am I accessing? The second bit uh, that you need to worry about more is attack service. And I'm, again, I'm getting a little bit meta here. Serverless, at its core, what it allows us to do, beyond the kind of, uh, the serverless as a platform allows us to do, you know, like magical automatic elasticity and low cost of uh, operation. From a software development perspective, what it gives us is flexibility, right? We take our application, we break it up into these extreme versions of microservices, very, very small functions, and then we just have this maximal flexibility. We can put together these blocks in whatever way we can. And that's awesome, right? It implies we don't need to reinvent the wheel even within our own application, within our company. More things are in the ecosystem. But you have to remember that flexibility implies risk. The easiest systems to secure are the ones that are not flexible. You know, the ones that are very rigid and behave in a predictable fashion. The more flexibility you introduce into your system, the more uh, potential points for an attacker to come through. I've got my uh, VP sales has a, a great phrase I like, which is accidents happen in intersections. <laughs> and you've just added more intersections into your application because more and more of these units interact with, uh, uh, with one another. So you have to consider that. You have to sort of embed that new perspective. And remember that Every function is a perimeter, right? You, you think, and this comes back to that single serverless YAML file, we still think in apps. 
we still deploy these functions as part of a unit. But, and, and therefore, we think about them as a perimeter. We have one function that calls another, a function that doesn't have an HTTP uh, gateway attached to it, calls, uh, sorry, one that has an HTTP uh, uh, API gateway applied to it, calls one that doesn't. The latter is probably secure because it's behind, you know, it has no HTTP access to it. Not so much, right? Once you break in, when somebody moves around your blocks, once you move around those blocks in six months' time, suddenly you're more exposed. So you have to think about every one of these functions as a perimeter, and that requires thinking and planning ahead of time, right? Because you don't want to just write brand new defense systems for every one of these functions. So how can you do this? A few tips and tricks. One, you want to test every function for security flaws independently. This comes back to the point I mentioned before. Functions are small, and we can take advantage of it by, by they have a, a, being able to test that they only do as expected is easier because the scope of what they do is smaller. So it's only feasible. Don't rely on limiting access to a function. I just explained that. You know, access controls would change over time. In you know, the future, you will move those blocks around, and suddenly the function that used to be behind five others is going to be at the front, right? Use shared input output processing libraries. Fundamentally, I don't think you can succeed without those. So if you want every function to be a perimeter and you want them sanitizing input again and again and again, you don't want every one of these functions writing code to sanitize input. You want to, as part of your organization, as part of your company, just use some libraries that sanitize input, try to be consistent about it. Make it easy to be secure. Um, and then you want to limit functionality to what you actually need. Right? Just that comes back to that sort of permission element of it. So if one of those functions was compromised, there's less that it can do. And then I would love to say that you also want to monitor you know, both the individual functions and the full flows. You know, like I'll say it, but I can't give you great advice exactly about how to do it. I'll talk about some tools in a sec. OK, so I'm almost at the end of both my time and my talk, uh, which is a good combination. Uh, so the last one I'm going to talk about where you need to worry more about is general security monitoring. And I'll explain. So I've got this like more function, more problems element. Serverless and FAS kind of flip on its head this question of whether something is worth deploying. It used to be that you'd, you'd ask that, you know, is this thing a piece of code that is worth the costs associated with deploying the pain in just rolling out and getting a server provisions, the cost of maintaining that server over time? In serverless, all of those are super easy. Deploying a function is, is easy. You don't pay unless it's used. You know, it really makes it, it flips it around to a question of why wouldn't I deploy this? And in fact, you have all these examples. You hear all these podcast people moving their cron jobs. You know, like serverless is the new cron job, right? You just kind of roll it out uh, and you put it somewhere because it could just be invoked at whatever capacity that you want at any time. So this type of easy deployment and minimal cost leads to a situation where you have lots of functions, right? We used to talk about 10,000 servers. Now we're going to talk about 10,000 functions. Uh, and many of those functions are lightly used, if at all. And just like permissions, they're easy to add, but they're hard to remove. That same dare I extended before about removing a permission, that would happen to a function that's been deployed for about nine months. It's sitting there, and you will delete it. Really. <laughs> you know? So you, you, you can, but only if you've sort of put the foundations around it. Couple that with that comment about uh, policies expanding and expanding until somebody adds an asterisk, and you get to this reality, right, where we have lots of functions. Many of them are lightly used or sort of irresponsibly de de deployed, and they have overly open policies. And my concern, kind of my fear here, is that th that is our future, you know, that that's the, the reality of, of, uh, of the serverless world moving for uh, forward. So we have to remember that every one of these functions introduces risk, right, that not having ops cost doesn't imply not having cost of ownership. Risk is still a cost. You know, management of these functions is still a cost. Some quick tips and tricks. Consider before you deploy. You know, just do you really need this? You know, don't just be overly uh, uh, trigger happy around deploying a function. When you do deploy it, separate them out. You know, have a separate environment into which you deploy these kind of playground functions and the ones in which you deploy production. Separate ones where you have systems that need to be available and ones that can be deleted. It's very easy to do this today. It's very hard to do this tomorrow. You want to track what you've deployed and how it's used. That's a little bit easier because, well, track what you've deployed is easy because the platform gives you that. How it's used is a little, uh, a little bit harder. Minimize permissions, we talked about it. 
uh, a concept. You can do a chaos style, reduce permissions, and see what breaks. I've been <coughs> saying this a while, hoping somebody actually builds a tool that does this. Hasn't happened yet, but you can try it. You know, just reduce permissions and see what happens. Uh, and you want to monitor for these known vulnerabilities in functions. It's a bit of a plug because it's kind of my space, but it's also you know, it's the easiest way for attackers to come in. And if you've done nothing, if you've deployed a perfectly secure function today and you've neglected it, it would not be perfectly secure over time. It would grow vulnerable. So these are kind of my, my last bullets. So I'm, I'm going over time here a little bit. So just to quickly recap, we talked about better areas, vulnerable operating system dependencies, denial of service, long lived compromise service. You know, you would naturally be better off moving to serverless on those areas. Permissions, securing data at rest, vulnerabilities in your code, and vulnerable app dependencies are areas where you need to adapt how you do them. You don't need to worry about them more or less than you did before. You need to worry about them, and you need to do something about them differently, maybe, or just prioritize them differently. And then third-party services, the broader attack surface about every function is a, uh, um, a perimeter, and just monitoring all of those functions is an area where there's more work for you to do, so you have to adapt yourself. Quick words about tools, unfortunately, Serverless is still a nascent space, and just like in all areas, it is a, a, a world in which tooling still has room for improvement. Um, this was a, a recent survey from uh, the new stack. It shows, it's kind of hard to see here a little bit, but uh, if I do this, does it work? Uh, not so much on the screen. Um, so it, it talks about how uh, uh, Honeycomb and IOPipe and Thundra, and then at the top you've got Epsagon and, and CloudWatch. Uh, at, the, uh, at the monitoring side are tools, you know, that's sort of interesting just, just as, a, as an observation. Uh, from a security perspective, you know, still low percentages here, 9%. Can I, can I still try to do this? Yeah. Here we go, a little bit more. Uh, so 9%, 9 uh, oh sorry, about 13% combined would use sneak, some twist lock, some pure sec that's, uh, uh, that's below. Most people don't use those types of tools. Very high level. The way you can think about them is that there are some tools like PureSec, TwistLock, uh, uh, Protego, uh, which are more SOC oriented, they're more about the security operation center, uh, saying, okay, I'll identify attacks, they're more runtime oriented. They almost all have some CICD element of it, but their kind of core element is this, um, how do I identify events and attacks and breaches in real time, and how do I do something about them? And then you have tools like, like Snyk that are more oriented at the CI/CD element, where it's really mostly around configuration analysis and vulnerable dependencies, uh, which is what you want to build into your process. So very quick summary, because we've run out of time here. Serverless dramatically reduces some top security threats. All in all, I would say serverless is good for security. You know, your security posture is better if you move to serverless, because it forces some good things on you. But Security is hard, and good attackers don't give up. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's, it's an area where there's, there, there's still, if there's still gold in them hills, attackers will find a way to try and reach it. So you have to understand that serverless shuffles security priorities, and you have to adjust your security priorities uh, accordingly. Right? It, it adjusts, it changes how attackers would look at your application, and you need to adjust how you look at your defenses. Um, you know, we talked about this matrix. And just to leave on a positive note, you know, the good opportunity here is that serverless is being defined now, both as an industry and inside your organizations, right? Like few organizations are mature in using serverless. That doesn't exist yet. So it means we get an opportunity to build these security controls into it from the get-go, which is also much easier than bolting them on. Thank you. <laughs>